The book of Proverbs is filled with wisdom and filled with practical insights. Now, if you ever chew gum, you notice that the flavor tends to fade, and it it fades pretty quickly. With the book of Proverbs, I encourage you just to chew on these Proverbs, and the insights that come out of them, they don't fade. You can chew on one all week long, and God will just keep feeding you spiritually and directing and guiding you. So today we're going to start with a question, and it's a question that's relevant to every season of life. And the question is, what's the plan? What's the plan? What's the plan with your job or career? What's the plan with retirement? What's the plan with the marriage? What's the plan with this season of singleness? What's the plan financially? What's the plan this summer? What's the plan to grow spiritually? What's the plan today? What's the plan this year? Uh, It keeps going. What's the plan for this church and the ministries in this church? Uh, It's a continuous question, but in a fast-moving culture, we oftentimes don't stop, pray, and think. So today, we're going to bring our plans before the Lord. The Lord will help us form new plans. We're going to connect with him and, again, walk in his wisdom. So as we do that, a reminder in the book of Proverbs, and it's 1412, chapter 14, and go down to verse 12, and it's really a warning, but a good reminder, because sometimes we get complacent. We get overconfident in our own planning instead of God's plan. And so Proverbs 14, 12 says, There is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. In other words, everything that looks good in life isn't. Everything that sounds good in life, every plan that you think is going to be perfect isn't. And we rely on the Lord. So that's the backdrop for today. And uh, this first section is going to be forming a plan. How do you form a plan? There's some principles in the book of Proverbs. So turn now one chapter to the right and go to 1522. In Proverbs, there's a lot of numbers that we call out. But I encourage you to to walk through these verses and uh, look at them for yourselves. You can highlight or write things down in your Bible. Uh, Proverbs 1522. Here's our first principle. Plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed. And so do this. Involve wise people who honor God. When you're forming your plans, involve other people. Wise people, people who honor God. Surround yourself with people who give solid advice and then listen to them. Listen to them. Let them speak into it. Let them share. And uh, it's been said before that You know, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. And that rings true so often in life. Show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Well, in the book of Proverbs, there's a key word that these friends provide. And it's called guidance. And it's a nautical term. And it's the same as steering a ship. And so life is a big ship, and we need a lot of people to help in the steering of the ship. And when God brings those wise people into your life, they are a gift from God, and they help the ship course and navigate through life even better than alone. So find people who are more knowledgeable than you. Yes, they do exist. They do exist. Uh, (laughs) More experienced than you. Know the word better than you. Uh, See your blind spots and love you and can communicate about that. See the potential in you that sometimes you want to sell things short, but they see God's potential in you. Surround yourselves with those kinds of people. It takes humility to let them in. It takes vulnerability to let them in, but you will so gain. It's a theme of the book of Proverbs. You will so gain when you humble yourselves and let them in. Now, you always want to weigh carefully every advice, and uh, that's important too. It's not just take everyone's advice, but they will improve the vision and the plan. They will help things be better unto the Lord if they have the right heart right there. And so the irony is Solomon writes this, is he had a son, Rehoboam, who is the fourth king in in the history uh, for the Israelites. And so You know, after the first three kings, and Saul and David and Solomon, here comes Rehoboam. And what has Solomon said? He he said here, get wise counsel around you. You know what we read about Rehoboam's life? He became the king when he was 41, and it says, this is telling of his life, he did not seek the Lord. 
He did not seek the Lord and the Lord's wisdom. And then also, he had a group around him of wise, experienced elders. And they were telling him, because his first decision was, should I be harsh with the people or nicer with the people? And they said, be kind. And he said, I don't like that advice. I want to show them who I am. And he threw off that advice. And then what happened? The Israelites, 12 tribes split. And after that, you see 10 tribes in the north, two in the south. And as the kings developed, I mean, even some of the better kings, there was no, the Bible says, no real good kings in the north, but in the south there were some, and Josiah brought reform, but you know what happened? Even in Josiah's mind, he thought, you know, I don't need to rely on God. I don't need advice anymore, and Nico from Egypt stepped forth, and, and Josiah wanted to take him out, and, and Nico said, no, this is not from God, and Josiah didn't listen to the advice, and Josiah died. And so we pay attention to that history because we don't want us to repeat the same mistakes. And the kings and the ones in leadership, so often they just pushed aside the Lord and uh, the advice around them. So we don't want to make that mistake. But instead, here at Grace, it's so important, we have teams. That's how we do ministry here at Grace. If you would say, well, I don't want to be part of that, I'm going to do my own thing. Well, what about the Bible? What does the Bible say about that? You know, with Jesus, we see he quickly finds a team of three. He finds a team of 12. He sends out a team of 72. It's the wise counsel together. We have teams. We, we collaborate. We pray. We seek God together. And uh, that's how ministry happens at Grace. That's what we see in the Bible. The Apostle Paul. Where do you find the Apostle Paul alone? He's always saying, you know, bring to me Timothy, and where's Silas, and Luke, come on over here. Let's do this together, and who are you doing it with, and let's do teams. And so ministry happens in the Bible and here at Grace, hardly ever alone. What is the Bible, the New Testament? Paul is writing letters to all the people to stay connected, to move people around, and then he's going on visits and missions trips to build up teams. So teams are so important. Wise counsel is so important. I want to give an example, uh, and some examples today from our church, current things, because we're not just talking about planning. We're in the middle of making plans, and one of them is a ministry called the Barnabas Ministry, and I have a picture of the building because uh, that's the Barnabas home, and right there, it's the southwest, if I have my directions right, corner of our property. I was going to say kind of by Starbucks, but I think there's a Starbucks by every corner of our property, so uh, that's not going to help as much. But that's the Barnabas uh, home right there. And several months ago, there's a lot of vandalism, a lot of damage, but um, some of the staff and a lot of, of our church has built it back up, and interior as well. And there's just a little more work to be done, but it's been a great um, just coming together and rebuilding that. Ministry is going to flow out of that. There's 25 people who have signed up to be on the ministry team. They've already met. They're continuing to pray. They're writing down ideas. They're talking with each other. They're praying. What are your passions? What are your gifts? They're laying out things every month. This ministry is building and growing to meet practical needs around our community. But it's in a process of planning. It's growing. It's happening, but it's also a lot of planning right now. So pray for them as they continue to plan through the rest of the year and uh, some of the great things God wants to do. God's entrusted that property to us and we're so glad it's almost ready to be used again. So that's an update right there. Now that's something that's already happening. Here's one. You ready just to leave the comfort zone for a minute and just dream for a minute? Uh, Leave just that safe box for a minute and just be open to this next thing. This is something that is not happening yet. We haven't made a decision on this, but here's what I wanted to share. There's an opportunity for this next Easter. You say, well, that's nine months away. That's right. Uh, that's the White River Amphitheater, and if you've um, never been there, no worries. It's here in Auburn, and uh, so that's a facility where usually there aren't a lot of Jesus events there. But there's an opportunity to have an event there to glorify Jesus. So we have an opportunity at Easter, and this is something the elders are praying about and have been and thinking through and talking through and staff the last month and pros and cons. And uh, a couple comments on this. Uh, One is if we did it, it would be very different than what we've done the last few Easters. So if we did this, it wouldn't be, okay, when we have Easter here at church, you know, some people are involved in serving, This would be all hands on deck. This would be, you know, everyone's in. Okay, when we have Easter here, we plan for, you know, a short amount of time. We do some planning. This would be months of planning before and then months of follow-up. When we have Easter here, there's a little bit of follow-up that happens, you know, a little bit. 
if we have Easter there, that is a huge follow-up for, for months with the community. If we have Easter here in our facility, we're saying to the community, come, come to us, come to us. But if we have Easter there, we're saying to the community, we are going to you. And, and we're meeting at a venue where you'd feel even more comfortable coming, and we're going to invite everybody. So there's some serious pros and cons to this. Uh, it's, it's outside of that little comfort zone. What I encourage you to do is, is to pray. And uh, here's something else tangible that you can do. As I mentioned, one of the factors that's on the elders' radar is, is what is the response from our church family. Where are we at with this possibility? Because it really does take all hands on deck to reach a community. As we think about 1.86 million people who don't follow Jesus, I mean, something like this is, is intentional to try to reach uh, our cities around us. So it really would take the whole church. And one thing that we're just doing today is kind of running a magnet through the sand where uh, when you step out in that hallway out there today, if this is something you just feel a stirring, you feel passionate, you have interest in, grab one of those cards, write your name on it, and just check a box that you might be interested in serving in that area. It doesn't mean you're locked in, but it means that, you know, I heard that, it, it's, it's, it's resonating with me, and I just want to write down that I have some real interest in that. Again, that's not the deciding vote. We're, we have a lot of time to decide on this one, but we do want input from the church family and to see where people are at with this one. So, uh, that's something, an example. And, you know, we have, I think, a, a, a leadership where um, it's not just decisions. Some decisions are made, you know, in staff levels or in elder levels and then shared. But this is a decision where we would open it up and say, this is something we're praying about. We're asking God for wisdom and I encourage everyone to be praying and asking God for wisdom as well. So that's an example in terms of making plans, a lot of input, a lot of seeking the Lord. Now, here's another principle from Proverbs. Look to the next chapter, Proverbs 16:2. 16.2 says this, All a man's ways seem innocent to him, but motives are weighed by the Lord. The principle, and it's easy to skip over this one when you make plans. Instead, check your motives before proceeding. Check your motives with your plans. And here's three motives that I think are traps that are common in our culture. Number one, the motive is selfish. Okay, this is all about me. That's really the motive. Uh, that's one trap. A second trap in, in motives is to have um, an unhealthy attempt to please other people. Have you ever made a decision that you knew wasn't right? You've compromised kind of your convictions. You've compromised things because you're trying to please someone in an unhealthy way. That is a motive. It, it's not good. A third motive is the love of money. Money's not evil. Money's a blessing. But the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. So the love of money is sometimes a driving force in our culture. Would you agree? <laughs> uh, I, I mean, we say, what's behind that one? Oh, money. Got it. Love of money. So uh, those three are common motives we need to keep our eyes on and try and stay away from. And uh, what this proverb says right here is a lot of our ways seem innocent to us, but the Lord sees our motivations. The Lord sees the why. And the Lord desires purity in our motivations. Uh, when I meet with couples sometimes, and let's say there's some friction in the marriage, we work through some plans. What's the plan for communication? What's the plan for conflict resolution? What's the plan in parenting right now? How, how is the parenting working together? What's the plan for work around the house? What's the plan in finances? What's the plan to grow spiritually? And we kind of walk through these different areas of life and talk, is there a plan? Are we on the same page? And underneath those plans, it's the motive that's the big one. The motive, because underneath the marriage, either there's selfishness in I want my plan, or there's an approach that says what's best for the marriage. What's best for the kids? What's best for the family? And you see, that motive, whatever your motive is in there, it'll show up in everything you do. But when the motive honors the Lord, the Lord blesses so much more. So have a motive that comes before the Lord. Be honest about where your motives are at and ask for motives that are pure and that would honor him. 
You know, I was thinking about this summer, and summer's a change of pace. We have four kids, you know, so they're, they're not in school. They're back home. We've got active kids, and it's like, okay, what's the plan for this summer? I came up with a, an initial idea, which was just, all right, kids, write down a little summer menu. Let's write down 20 things you enjoy doing. And so we got that list out because the phrase you hear sometimes in the summer is, I'm bored. I'm bored. Well, let's get out the 20. Let's get out the top 20. Make a pick. My wife had a far greater plan, and she developed themes. So each week has a theme. Uh, park theme, swimming theme, serving theme, friends theme, and then schedules all around that. And so uh, I'm just so grateful. My wife's such a good mom, and uh, and what's happened? The kids have so benefited from that. And so what started out with a plan of, you know, how can we serve the kids? The motives were right. The Lord has blessed that this summer. It's been a really good summer. So I encourage you, in whatever arena you're making plans, just check those motives, bring them before the Lord, because when they're honorable, the Lord blesses. Now, here's a, another principle. Turn to Proverbs 21, 31. 21, 31. This is one of those that you could memorize. Again, so practical. The horse is made ready for the day of battle, but victory rests with the Lord. I come back to that so often when I'm making plans. Uh, here's the principle. Think through all of the factors and then prepare faithfully. Think through all the factors. As you prepare, one thing I like to do is just write out pros and cons in details. I like to see it all so I don't overlook something. Write it all out. Here's another one as you prepare. The bigger decision, spend more time in prayer. The bigger decision, take longer, if you can, in making that decision. Not just knee-jerk, emotional, rushed. The bigger decision, more time, more prayer. Here's another one that's relevant. Uh, if you make that plan, can you handle the worst-case scenario? Just to think through, okay, if worst-case scenario happens, can, can you handle that? Are you still in? Another one, have you set everyone else up for success as you prepare? Have you set other people up for success? Have you really done that well? These are all uh, different aspects of making a plan. The point of this verse here in Proverbs is that we do our part. We're faithful in preparing, but victory rests with the Lord. The outcome is his. We rely on him, but we want to be faithful in the preparing and sometimes, to be honest, the preparing includes the mundane. Solomon built a temple for God. Do you know how long it took? Seven years. That's like some of our home projects, right? <laughs> Started to build the deck seven years ago. Well, this was a huge project. And so this involved finding the best uh, wood, you know, the, the olive, the cedar wood. This involved construction of rocks and even doing it outside, then bringing them in, overlaying things with gold. Seven years, and it was going to be 90 by 30 and 45 feet high, and it's just how the Lord wanted. You read the same with Moses, just how the Lord wanted. Diligent in what happens when they honor God with that? God's glory shows up in the temples. And so again, when you're faithful and you're faithful in the little things and you're faithful in preparing, God's blessing and his glory. And he's the one who gives the victories. Now in Luke 14, you don't have to turn there, but I wanted to read what Jesus said, and the context is interesting. More and more people are following Jesus. The crowd's getting bigger and bigger. So what does Jesus do? He challenges the crowd. You ever notice that? When the crowd gets bigger and bigger, Jesus tends to thin the herd and reminds them what it really means to follow him. So in Luke 14, 28, he says this to the big crowd. The thing to do at that moment was follow Jesus. So Jesus says, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? For if he lays that foundation and is not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule him, saying, this fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Jesus adds, or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Will he not first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able... He'll send a delegation while the other's still a long way off and ask for terms of peace. Now, here it is. Wait for it. Here it is. In the same way, any of you 
who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. Jesus is saying, prepare, plan. Okay, it's trendy to follow me, Jesus is saying. No, no, no. Not halfway followers, not half-hearted followers. If you're not all in, you're not fit to be my disciple. <laughs> that kind of goes countercultural. You know, we think, oh, bigger crowd, bigger crowd, water it down, make it easier, make, make it, you know, not what really is. Jesus is saying, no, I'll tell you what it really is. And there it is. So prepare. When you think about following Jesus, prepare, plan, and it's everything. It's everything in our life. To trust him with everything. So, uh, again, that's when he blesses. That's when he blesses. We do our part, and we ask for his help. I know a lot of people are, are looking for jobs. You, you put that resume together as well as you can. You send it out to everywhere where you think the Lord might have you, and you pray, ultimately, if you get a job, it's the Lord's blessing. But you've done all the preparing along the way. Um, so here, here's an example of, of preparing and asking for the Lord's blessing. One more uh, plan that we're in the middle of right now, and it's our Real God Outreach. And this is going to start. The launch is in seven days. And so if you, you know, if you've been traveling this summer and you haven't heard what's going on, Real God Outreach is basically uh, three sources of videos. One is we found videos that are really, really well done that you can share with someone who isn't following Jesus yet. We're going to make those available to the whole church uh, throughout the week. Uh, every week, we're going to make those available. Second, we're, we're making some videos. And then third, people are going to send in their story, their testimony. So we're going to have all three sources of videos, and we can use those, share those. There's a website, realgod.info, Facebook. We're going to use social media, and we're going to reach out to people through this. So what have we been doing the last couple months? Praying. I mean, a team's been involved. We've had training times here at church. We've set up the website in, in Facebook. The table, it's still out there now. Many of you have, have volunteered. We have uh, sheets out there, the 10 ways you can get involved. Uh, there's been emails sent out. It's all been building up. So one week away, we're, when we do this, it, it's a bigger example of when you share the gospel with someone, when you share about Jesus with someone and how to have a relationship with him, you never know what's going to happen. You never know. But God says be faithful in sharing the gospel and then trust him with the results. So prepare the horse for battle. Victory rests with the Lord. And so we are going to share the gospel with so many people starting in one week and with God's help and just trust him with the results. We're doing this together as a church and it's an exciting thing. It's a new thing as we think about reaching our friends, our family, uh, loved ones in our community, but it can be with people overseas through the technology God has given us. So uh, prepare the horse for battle. Victory rests with the Lord. That's an example of, of now going from forming the plan, which has been happening the last two months, to now carrying out the plan. And it's the shift right now in the, in the message. We're, we're talking about forming a plan, how to form a plan, now carrying out a plan. So, and that's where it gets exciting because, I don't know, maybe we have some people here who just love to form plans and they don't care you know, about carrying them out. But for me, the exciting part is when you've been forming, praying, working, and then now it's time to carry it out. So let's look in this last section of carrying out a plan and go back to Proverbs 16.3. And uh, it says this, Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and your plans will succeed. So the principle is staying committed to the Lord in the difficulties. Okay, your plans will succeed. This is how life works. You commit to the Lord, and in general, the plans will succeed. Now, how do we define success? If success means I'm going to get whatever I want, don't bank on that. Don't bank on that. We, we can commit things to the Lord and we don't get what we want. In fact, plans change. There can be, can be disappointing. Dreams sometimes don't continue. It can be deflating uh, and it can be difficult. It can be brutal. During those times, we stay committed to God because he builds character. He builds faith. He builds our testimony through those hard times in, in the dark valleys. Uh, he builds depth with him. He builds our compassion for other people and what they're going through. He brings good out of even the worst situations when we stay committed to him. So what is success? Success, again, is faithfulness. Faithfulness. Uh, John the Baptist said, I must decrease so Jesus will increase. That's faithfulness. Jesus will increase. 
Commit to him means whatever matters to God, I'm all in. What does matter to God? Integrity matters to God. Stay committed to him with your integrity. Honoring his word matters to him. Stay committed. Using our time and our talents and our treasures generously matters to God. We read it throughout his word. Uh, Trusting God matters to him with the little things and the big things. Did anyone catch the story yesterday, Luke Aikens? Out of the, um, out of right here, uh, out of Tacoma area, jumped out of an airplane 25,000 feet high without a parachute. The first person ever to do this, he's okay, you can exhale, he's okay, uh, landed in fishing net. Uh, and, and so when I think about that, Luke Aikens put all of his trust in some fishing net, and it didn't even hold up during some of the test runs they were doing, but he put all this trust in the fishing net, and I thought, what a radical example of trust. (laughs) I'm not saying jump out of an airplane without a parachute and say, Lord, bless it. Um, But what I am saying is when I think of that example, God wants us to trust him in the same radical way. All in, Lord, I'm banking completely on your word. I'm I'm banking 100% on what your word says. God, I'm living my life as if your word is true, and I believe every word of it. And to trust him with the results. So committing doesn't mean lazy, passive. Committing doesn't mean outward religion, impressive show on the outside, spiritual front, but no commitment deep down underneath it. Commitment doesn't mean, okay, God, I give you a little control. Now I take back the control. That's not committing it to the Lord. God, I'm taking that back right back from you. That, that's not commitment. But, but we, we want to do that sometimes. It doesn't mean quit when things get tough following Jesus. That's not committed to the Lord. But here's this beautiful picture. And I think this is committing it to the Lord. This is abiding. I'm going to read from Psalm 37. And you could just, Psalms to the left of Proverbs, you could write this down, this sequence here. This is is following God right here. Verse 4, delight yourself in the Lord. Praise the Lord. In other words, draw near to God, worship him. And he will give you the desires of your heart. He will start to put desires in your life, in your heart, in your mind that are from him. Then commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him. And then he will do this. He will make your righteousness shine like the dawn, the justice of your cause like the noonday sun. You will find rest when you commit your way to the Lord. Delight in him, listen, commit, trust him. Trust him fully. Here's the next principle. Be flexible and make adjustments as needed. (laughs) Proverbs 16 Uh, Great chapter, Uh, a lot of verses on making plans. Drop down to verse 9. Proverbs 16, 9 says this. In his heart, a man plans his course, but the Lord determines his steps. One of the phrases you'll hear at Grace a lot of times is, okay, what are the next steps? What are the next steps? What are the action points? The action point is who's doing what, when, and then we hear back from them. It's good to have when you're forming plans. Who's doing what, when? What's the next step? But even as we take the next steps, God brings, again, mid-course redirections. God brings surprises. Give God room to move. Uh, A phrase the worship team uses, give God the eraser. If we're doing something that's not from God, let God erase those plans and change those plans. Plan in pencil is another good phrase because oftentimes God wants us to have that plan and be walking, you know, in step with the Spirit along that plan, and we'll realize at some points, oh, God wants us to go in that direction. And you know what? Some of the best experiences in life will often be unplanned. It'll be when you're following God's plan, and then you didn't see something coming. It's still in God's plan, but it's unplanned. And to be able to have the flexibility and the teachability to say, okay, Lord, I see that you're in that now, and I say yes to that. And so that's how... When you look at the book of Acts and the history of the church, that's how it was. It was an exciting, it was a mystery, it was seeking God day after day. What is God going to do this week? What's God going to do this hour? What is he going to do? Let's seek him, let's listen, let's abide, let's respond, let's stay flexible, let's be teachable. Could be Corinth, could be Thessalonica, could be Philippi, could be going back to Philippi. 
could be sharing our faith with this lady that just walked up to us. It is that in the moment, being flexible, ready to serve the Lord. I will say this about what we read in the book of Acts and what's true today. God's people, the church, is God's plan A. There's no plan B. The church, you and I, God's plan A. Do you see how many times they blow it in church history? Do you, see, you know how many times we blow it? If God wanted to just say, fine, church, I'm not using any of you ever again. I'm going with this other plan. I think he would have done that by now. He sticks with us. God uses sinful people. There are no perfect people. We learn, we repent, we get back on track, we follow the Lord. We are his plan A. There is no plan B. The Holy Spirit working through us, Christ in us, the hope of glory. So we say yes, God, to your plan. And we do it humbly. James reminds us this. When we're making all these big plans, he says, now listen. James 4.13, you who say Today or tomorrow, we'll go to this city and that city, and then we'll spend a year there. We'll carry on our business. We'll make all this money. Why? You don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or do that. So we say, if it's God willing, we say that with sincerely. God willing will do this. God willing will do that. If the Lord's in and he's blessing and leading us, if he opens that door, we'll do it. But we, are, we say that because it communicates reliance and dependence on God. We are not gods. We rely on God. And so uh, that's what James reminds us of. Here's a couple other things. Plans are happening in the church. We're going to have a Saturday night service, Lord willing. October 2nd and October 30th, two dates coming up in the fall. And uh, there are a lot of people who have signed up, excited about that possibility of Saturday night service. This is even continuing after that. We're taking this first step, and then we'll see how it goes. Uh, there might be another one in December. Right now, it's just one prayerful step at a time. There's another sign up in the hallway. If you, Saturday night service is something you're really interested in, just put your name down there on that. We're going to have a meeting at the end of August to talk about some Saturday night service stuff that's going to be happening. Uh, so uh, two dates in October Maybe right now, one date in December, but we're just going to see what the Lord does. Those two dates in October, by the way, the Seahawks also have games early the next morning. <laughs> and if you study recent church history and grace, like the last decade or so, you kind of notice when the Seahawks play at 10, the church looks different. So anyways, <laughs> I, I didn't mean, that, that wasn't a drive-by guilt. That was just like, a, a, you know, this is what happened. So anyways, we're going to have Saturday night services two times, but also... It's not just that. I'm kind of having some fun with that. But there's been a lot of um, interest in a Saturday night service and the potential there. So um, we also are, are going to take it one step at a time with that. Here's another one. <laughs> Be flexible. Camp right now. Did, did you know that after the 1045 service, there's over 100 of our students going to camp for the week? Isn't that awesome? And so can you imagine how much planning that took? And, and then also, what, what's also incredible is the number of people from our church who go to help and who have planned time off work and will jump in to the action for the week. And I think that's incredible. Now, our student mysteries team, of course, has a lot of things laid out. You know, the games, um, you know, exciting stuff, the ultimate swing, the tubing, you know, just all the different things, the Bible study, the worship. They've got a whole plan, but when you get to camp, does everything follow the plan exactly? I mean, I don't think so. So you got to be flexible. You ever been on a mission trip? You got to be flexible. You ever do ministry here? You got to be flexible, led by the Spirit. So the plan's there, but listening from the Lord. And, and by the way, in a couple weeks, the, the camp will be coming up for kids third to sixth grade. And um, today's the last day of the early bird special on the cost. Um, this is just sounding like a no shame commercial now. But, uh, but anyways, we just got our family in, so it's the last day on that. But same thing for Christy and her team. It's, it's all the planning that goes into it, but then it's like, okay, we're in camp. Now, Lord, what do you want to do? And staying flexible. Um, when I'm writing down plans, I use my phone. 
I like to take an eight and a half by 11 blank piece of paper and write things down. I take three by five cards and I write things down. I'm always just trying to listen to the Lord, get time in his word, pray, write things down. Uh, the staff will tell you I've got sticky paper. It's just, it comes to meetings. It's just, that's what I do. Little stickies, I'm writing things down all the time. Figure out for you how it works to connect with God, make plans, stay flexible with those plans, keep changing, writing those down. You know, make that a part of your walk with God. Yesterday I was, at, I like to play soccer Saturday mornings. Yesterday, you know, the game was starting and I just said hello to this one guy and we started talking some more. And he's from Cameroon. We just kept talking and talking and the game's starting and I like to play and I get up early to play but it's like this conversation and we just had this great conversation about Jesus and he just shared a lot from his life and it's a I was missing the game. I was just thinking, God's in this right here. God's in this. So even if you have stuff you like to do and you like to be all planned, just what is God in? Let's keep staying tuned into him. And then here's the last principle. Look at Proverbs 21, verse 5. Proverbs 21, 5 says this. The plans of the diligent lead to profit as surely as haste leads to poverty. So identify and communicate the markers of success. Identify and communicate. Godly people make plans, have plans. They're prayerful plans. And those plans bear fruit. They bear fruit. And then it's important to identify and communicate the markers of success. Be proactive. Uh, in other words, um, this is important when you're working on teams. You say, what are we aiming for? As best as we can tell, what does God want us to aim for? And do we all know that? And do we know what that priority is with the team, with the plan, with the family? What, what's our family going for? What's success in your family? What's success in your marriage? Does everyone know what you're going for? And then to be on that same page. All know. Sometimes you need a timeline. Sometimes you make things measurable. Uh, so uh, what, what's the plan? You know, my parents... On uh, WhatsApp, they're sending updates because they're in Poland. It's been their, their trip planned for a long time to go to Europe. And the, the goal of that trip was to have fun, refreshment, you know, slow down, just check out European history. And they got there and they realized that the Pope is here this week. And so it completely, you know, was not on the radar. They were not checking the Pope's schedule when they, when they got their airline flights. And so suddenly they land in Poland. There's just people everywhere now in the city. And it's like, whoa, what was our original plan? What, what's happening to it? Uh, interestingly, we also have an email with our international partners at church here. We have 40 international partners. Um, Ashley and Jamin are also in Poland. Same city. Our international partners, my parents, like here, here it comes. This is what they shared. See, they're in Poland for a very different reason. And yes, the Pope is there. So they are joining the anticipated 3 million young people from 187 countries around the world for a Catholic festival called World Youth Day. And this is what our international partners share. The Catholic Church has recognized that they don't have the resources available to share the gospel with all these students. So the Archbishop has invited us to come and do outreach and share Jesus with these young people and also to train up so many people and how to share their faith. And they write, when you hear about humility like that and an earnest and loving desire to do gospel work shoulder to shoulder, you know God is at work. I often get goosebumps just thinking about this. So there will be at various booths and stations having spiritual conversations. Many of our team, um, of course, is fluent in English, but that also is a, is a language that they speak. So we're going to be able to do this in English with so many of the, the students. And I thought, what an incredible opportunity right there for some of our international partners. And, and it's nothing against a, a fun vacation in Europe. My, my, I'm happy for my parents. But uh, there's also another reason, you know, to, to be in Poland at the same time. And again, I go back to what's the reason you're doing what you're doing? What's the plan? What's the marker of success? Because I think some people do life with the goal, you know, kind of like my parents in Poland of it should be fun. And I hope life is fun. And, it, and we're doing it just for us. And we're just doing it because we're here. And some people live in Auburn and live in South Sound because you know God has placed you here 
and you're thinking about Jesus, and you're thinking about connecting people with Jesus, and success isn't just fun or a nice house or, or a good car, but success in life is so much richer than that. You see, what you're aiming for, that's usually what you hit. And so it is good to think through plans and what's most important and make those with the Lord. Not, not careless, but I like the old phrase, you plan your work and then you work your plan. Praying, God, what, what do you want the most? And what, what a posture to just say, God, I surrender to you. God, whatever is for your glory. Uh, make the plans big enough for reliance on the Lord. In Proverbs 11.30, it says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he who wins souls is wise. When you walk in wisdom, people see the wisdom of God. They're drawn to God. When you walk with him, there's fruit and there's joy and there's peace and people see that and they're drawn to God. You know, one of the elders sent me an email yesterday. Lifeway Research has shown that, um, and they did a research among people who don't follow Jesus. We've talked about 1.86 million in, in King and Pierce counties that don't follow Jesus. And they've done some research nationwide about people who don't follow Jesus. And you know what was interesting? 80%. 80% that don't follow Jesus would be glad to listen to someone sincerely sharing their faith. 80% would be glad to listen to someone who sincerely shares their faith. And, uh, and so also, only a third of those people said that, that any Christian has ever shared with them why to follow Jesus. What's so good about following Jesus? Why do you need to follow Jesus? Why is Jesus? Well, only a third of those people have someone sharing with them. And so he who in souls is wise. The plans we make should include glorifying God. They should include, you know, serving other people, leading other people to Jesus. Uh, God has a plan, and it's his son on a cross, his son in a tomb, his son risen, his son returning. That's God's plan. It, it's the ultimate plan, and his ultimate plan should so influence all of our plans in the short time we have on earth. So the take-home is this. The best plans in life, they magnify the Lord, and they lead to transformed lives. And, you know, our family, every summer, we've gone to Mount Hermon Camp in California, incredible camp. And that camp, over 70,000 lives are touched for Jesus every single year through Mount Hermon. And their motto is, you know, transform lives. And when I'm at camp, I mean, there's so many games, and the kids have a blast, and there's all this fun and great food and all these different things happening. But at the core of everything they do, transform lives. At the core of everything they do, Jesus. And I was, I was thinking about that camp, saying, what if that's true of our lives? I and mean, we have fun, we have a blast, we have family get-togethers, we have summer trips, but at the core of every plan we make, it's submitted to Jesus, and it's for his glory. We can't go wrong. We can't go wrong, church. We make those kind of plans. Let's pray. Father God, help us as we make our plans, as we think ahead to the rest of the summer and the fall, as we stop and think, what's the goal of this marriage? What, what's the goal of raising these kids? What's the goal of being single right now? What's financial? What's the plan? Ministry, using our gifts, what's the plan? Lord, help us not to be lazy or have no plan. We know potential is missed when there's no plan. But your word tells us, and we read it in Proverbs, make the plan, get godly counsel, be humble, be teachable. Lead us, Lord, in our plans. And Father, we thank you for your plan of paying the price for us. And we pray if anyone here has not yet put their trust in you, Jesus, that eternity would start, eternal life with God would start today. Make a decision to receive his grace. Put your trust in him. And God, as a church, we lay before you our plans. Barnabas ministry, Saturday night service, camp this week, prison ministry, Easter. Lord, so many different plans have your way, God. Help us to not just be stuck in our own thinking, our own selfishness, God, but help us to walk by faith, walk into your plans. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.